Hello and welcome to the Queer Manga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute. And along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education and outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Queer Manga Institute is a nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and supporting the rediscovery of ancient practice of ecstatic trance postures. And it was the insightful work of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman, who found the clues and revived the practice. Uh, she searched for the oldest evidence available, which she discovered in the world's collection of prehistoric and indigenous art, and decoded these selected artifacts as ritual instructions. And as an educational institution, we recognize to thrive, we must take an open approach. So we invite scholars of parallel research and related fields to help broaden the scope of our work and exploration. We have a full spectrum of topics, both uh, now available on YouTube, uh, also podcasting, neuroscience, mysticism, trance states, anthropology, art history, uh, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, shamanism, mythology. It goes on and on. And you're welcome to visit our website at queamungainstitute.com. And of course, all of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a member. And for those of you that have become supporting members, we thank you for continuing to support the mission of the Cuyamonga Institute. The power and spirit of the first peoples of the Pacific Northwest has a long, deep history, and it continues today. Tribes in uh, British Columbia, Alaska, Washington, Oregon, each have their own history, cultural and religious traditions represented in their art, their stories, their songs, their dances. And it's the beautiful land and waters of this part of the world that provides rich natural resources and the need for artistic expression. And within the Pacific Northwest, many different nations develop their own distinct history, um, culturally, society, but they also have something they share in common, elements such as salmon, uh, which is a very important aspect and in, in, uh, important in their culture. The creation of beautiful practical objects uh, are a means of transmitting stories and history and wisdom from generation to generation. Art provides the first peoples with a tide of the land by depicting their own histories on totem poles, on the face of the big plank longhouses, in their artwork, in all aspects of their lives. The symbols depict what then and they are today a constant reminder of their birthplaces. Sculpturals and decorated artwork were also part of daily life. And artists applied embellishments to all their tools, the houses, the baskets, the clothing, all the items. And, and it, had a, it had a connection to the spirit, to the supernatural world of, of their culture. And these wood sculptures and paintings, notably like totem poles, are one of the most renowned features of the Northwest found uh, from the Northwest, recognized from around the world. And archaeologists discovered, including art, these artistic carving tools, they found pieces that are thousands of years old. And they're saying that this goes back at least 5,000 years. There's been this tradition of the potlatch, a gift-giving feast that's been practiced throughout the Northwest Coast. And this is from their perspective. Of course, we'll have the, the gift today of talking to Randy, who may say it's much longer and deeper than that. But we want to thank you for joining us today. And Laura, you want to do a quick introduction? Oh, just a couple of words. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. And um, Native art is just as inherent to that land as the furs, as the ocean, as uh, it's just part of the land. And I've seen it all my life and it's so majestic and it's so evocative. And I know when I imported Paul and brought him to the Northwest, the first thing that he wanted to do was go see the source of this art. He was so taken with it. The Burke Museum, um, Bill Holmes' work there. I got to sit in on a couple of Bill Holmes' lectures at the University of Washington. That's where I graduated from. And um, it's just such beautiful art, so majestic and, and just so rich. What I appreciate, too, is that these, as art is all over the world, cultural containers of ancestral wisdom. So um, in Friday Harbor, the place to go to see Native art is the Ra Arctic Raven. And Lee Brooke happens to be a good friend of my sister Kimberly. And so through long conversations with Lee and looking at all the art in his gallery, um, this 
talk right here was born. And Lee suggested his uh, good friend and one of his prominent artists, Randy Cook. Um, and also, we do want to talk more with the elders of the tribes. And mm -hmm. Randy is that as well. Young man, but still an elder. Yeah. Um, he's holding the chiefdom there of the Kwa Kwa Kawak tribe. So this is going to be an exciting conversation today. Before we go there, one thing I had asked uh, to do was maybe before we get to the contemporary world, let me just show a little bit of historical photos just as an introduction. And I'll do that for just a few slides. Okay. I just wanted to add the elements and the power of this culture. And so I gra gathered up a few of the historic photos. This is from the very early 1900s. It's a very famous photo, and it's also a video clip of this, this, uh, this canoe trip. Uh, the canoes and... Just go through the slides. Okay, I won't go through. I won't. I'll just go through. You have experts to talk about I'll let this. him tell. Yeah. Guess what? Totem poles. I just wanted to show some of the historical elements, the artwork, the mass making, the amulets, the pipes, all the aspect of the art, where all this stuff was inspired from that is carried in the culture. Longhouses. It's interesting to drop the, the year 5,000 years ago because at the time they're building the pyramids, this culture was thriving as well. a shaman mm. yeah so i thought it would be great to put it in context and i know many of our many of our participants are international people who may not be as familiar with the pacific northwest as we are so i wanted to give some context before we go into today's world and what's happening in the world of art of the northwest coast so i'm gonna pull up lee first here we go hello lee hey lee so he is sitting in his beautiful gallery in Friday Harbor, Washington. Yeah. So, so, so Lee, we appreciate all that you do to support the artists because it is very exciting to see the contemporary artists today who are taking their ancestral forms and motifs and mythologies and uh, representations, incorporating them into art today and also um, using new materials and new expressions for this. I know Randy will talk a lot about that, but um, just we appreciate what you do to help make the connections, to help keep well, it alive. You. You're doing your part. What is, what is your story? How did you, get, how did you get in this position, Lee? How did you end up? What, what call to adventure did yeah. you answer to find yourself there? Hey, the last time we were together, we talked about how indigenous people live in two worlds today. When a pot lets, dancers move one way into the dance and move another way out of the dance. Hmm. They're always one step away from the other world. Paul observed that they do this while carrying both worlds each time. Randy finds himself in another world of art, along with the both worlds that he already occupies. This adds the pressure that he feels today to justify himself in this unique position. And now um, I kind of need to explain what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm just a hippie left over from the 70s who ended up on San Juan Island. I grew up on a farm near another small town in Washington state called La Connor. Well, we have a slough that runs through that. One side of the slough is the Swinomish Indian Reservation. The other side of the slough is the one that I grew up with. Native culture was always right next to me, but it seemed so far away. Native art began to resonate with me one day while sitting next to a totem pole, as you were discussing. It was carved by a guy named Bill Holm. He was on our campus, and something about it just tugged at me. It had smooth, strong lines that seemed to gather strength from some other place. Was it the design itself, or the scale of the old growth red cedar from which it came? Evergreen State College had just arrived on the scene and began offering more innovative studies. My college began to offer them also and launched an experimental quarter for their special students. Well, they thought it was one. And I got to create um, a course about the local indigenous artwork. And that was easier said than done. There were no books in the library about Northwest Coast art with a single exception of a book called 
an analysis of form, coincidentally written by Bill Holm. Bill Holm. He lectured at other colleges, so I traveled there to hear him speak. Still not venturing across the slough to ask Kevin Paul's father about the totem pole in his front yard. <laughs> at one point in my life, the rug got pulled out from under me. I lost everything and had to start over. I may as well go for something I wanted. So the notion of gallery um, came into being, well, why not go for it? One thing I did learn while researching native studies is that the information I was looking for was not in the libraries. Mm -hmm. And there's only one book, it was Bill's, and I was said, now there's hundreds. This is when it became time to cross that slough, see what was happening on the other side. Well, my curiosity led to many trips to Vancouver Island as well. I ventured to various Alaskan destinations, also whalebone and ivory carbon became a passion for me after several trips to St. Lawrence Island on the Bering Sea and Shishmaraf, also along the coast. And I um, just want to show you some examples of a work from Shishmaraf that I discussed at the beginning of the talk. And I was showing um, a picture of a fan dancer by George Kakuna. This is a whalebone rib, uh, polar bear ruff, and uh, walrus ivory face. Um, there's another carving uh, somewhere I traveled to on St. Lawrence Island, um, a carver in Savunga named Edwin Nungwuk. Here's a hunting scene. The base is on a walrus backbone. With the seal below, it's a, wall, uh, it's a hunter above. And in this story, the hunter is hunting for the seal, but seal um, kind of eludes him. And, and in the story, he gets away. This is another example of a, a carver in uh, Savunga, Mary Sepalu, a dog sled team, a single walrus tusk. And walrus, uh, excuse me, these are mammoth ivory dogs that she uses. This is the pelvis from a whalebone. This is by Richard Olana. It's a walrus transforming with a hunter. And there's a belief that when the hunter is hunting the walrus, a successful hunter can actually transform and trade places with him and share an experience and actually transform. Successful hunters can transform and become uh, successful by communicating with these guys. The other thing I do is Inuit art. This is just an example of one piece. I like the way the lines run through it uh, for this dancing bear by Makusi Papagata. Uh, just another quick example of stone carving from Inuit that I also um, deal with. So I met Randy Cook on one of these journeys uh, to Vancouver Island after spending a couple of days in Victoria. I headed up north to Duncan one evening when another gallery owner mentioned he wondered if I knew about the moon mask that he's carving in Victoria. Moon mask. Some feeling came over me to change direction and head back south. Randy was just finishing up the wolf moon mask I'm looking for, it came fine, and <laughs> getting ready to call Melanie at the Inuit Gallery in Vancouver. So I told him that, he, that I had a checkbook and he probably didn't need to do that, and that kind of started our relationship. <laughs> After that, I did a number of shows. Um, this is one of them. Uh, this is called Deeply Carved. I just wanted to read from the back of this particular one. This is what was written on the back. It says, it's becoming clear that the impulses underlying the resurgence of native art cannot be neatly isolated from those underlying other expressions of native vitality. They're part of the same cultural fabric fabric in the process of regenerating itself. So I went on and did a lot of shows, did about 60 of them. Um, this is another example of a sea monster by Tom Hunt. This is to honor his grandfather, who is Sam Henderson, uh, who was known as Numasta, who kept carting alive when it was outlawed. And uh, we did this show to honor his grandfather and to honor his family. Uh, we wanted to do a one-man show, but it was more important to honor his family first. We did this show for my 20th anniversary. It's called In Creation, The Raven Sings. This is a lingcod headdress by Richard Hunt. Uh, it's Quagioth. Uh, Quagioth is very thackeray, uh, very decorative, and very noisy. Um, there's two levers at the bottom. The red one pulls an ellipse and makes it go clack, clack, clack. And the other one makes the fins go up and down and go clack, clack, clack. And it's a raucous theatrical performance. I invited 10 artists to that. I hosted all of them. 
And among them, of course, was Randy Cook when he created this piece, a more contemporary piece. Richard is third generation uh, carver. Randy is a first generation carver and his work is, uh, of course, much more contemporary, including this piece called uh, Behind the Mask. Um, I was looking through shows and I just coincidentally, I did that this morning. Well, I guess you can't see the scene. Uh, maybe see how this works. But there was another show by uh, Greg Colfax. It was a mask, a macaw mask that I wanted to share with you. Another one by Susan Point called Symphony of Butterflies that we did. I just found these at the last minute and thought they were fun. Mm, this was Emerging Artists, or Emerging Spirits, I called it. And it was artists, this is Arthur Vickers, and this was the beginning of his career. And I helped with a lot of young careers. Along the Shore by uh, Tony Hunt Jr., uh, another legendary carver. Yes. And this is an Inuit piece that we did, a caribou uh, for one of our shows. But I just wanted to flash those by you uh, while we're doing this. So Richard received his honorary degree from the University of Victoria, and Randy's currently studying for his degree there. And so the show called In Creation, The Raven Sings, kind of sounds like what I want to do with the rest of my life. Well, San Juan Island was a home to many Coast Salish groups. The Swinomish, the Samish, the Lummi band spent time here, as well as the Souk and the Songhe from Canada. They both had the same timeless tradition that tourists have today. They hung around to fish and pick berries and went back home after the weather changed. <laughs> <laughs> they married and stayed. They became known as the Mitchell Bay Band. The Mitchell Bay Band was, uh, well, Mitchell Bay was a home to a Coast Salish longhouse on San Juan Island in the past. The early settlers burned it down. Oh. They erased the last footprint of the indigenous people here. Susan Point changed that when we stood Coast Salish House Post in Friday Harbor once again. Her contemporary stories are told on two old growth cedar logs that carry a 14 foot cedar okay. beam. The, the, you've got to click on it because it's not changing. There it so is. we missed the last two slides. Oh, so these are, this is the footprint in Friday Harbor. This looks out to Friday Harbor. You can see the ferry in the distance. There is um, a cougar and a woman on one side. The cougar is coming out of hibernation. And if you look carefully, you see one hand above the other hand. Mm -hmm. that neither one is dominant. Now the other side of this house post has a whale and a, a food chain. It's called interaction and it encourages the viewer to learn about the uh, ocean, the undersea world, before you go and interact with it. Smart. And that's the purpose of having those there. You were instrumentally in getting those um, erected there, weren't you? We spent three years raising um, money for that. It was a little bit off the charts for us. Nobody had ever expected that we could do it. We kept going, kept going, kept going. And yeah, we were able to, um, through donations uh, from the community, erect those and establish the Coast Salish footprint here on San Juan Island one more time. Yeah. And then there's a ceremony that happened with canoes uh, coming in and landing. And that's a separate event. That's a yearly event when the uh, canoes oh. land. And they actually landed right out front here. Uh, we called these the portals of welcome when we we're fundraising for them. But her title for it was um, interaction. Interaction. And so we did other um, shows after that. And here's one of the guys we're going to talk to next. This is the one that received, this is in the spirit of our ancestors, uh, by the one that received the spirit. This piece is called In the Beginning by Randy Cook. And this is the first piece that he did for our last show. This panel is six feet by six feet. Um, it shows their first ancestor and the old ancestors protecting it firmly, um, protecting the young new beginning. Uh, this is another piece that he did for the um, show. This is actually uh, over my shoulder. Um, Randy's taken a personal effort to save old growth red cedar trees on Vancouver Island. In one of his trips up there, he found an old piece of red cedar, old growth cedar, and brought it home and didn't know what he would do with it. And it occurred to him that maybe the birds would replant seeds for the future. And this is what it turned into. You can see the bird on the top. He's planting a seed and you can see the growth below. It was just evolving in an embryo uh, type shape. And it's about 
to replant for the future. This is another example of old growth red cedar. This was a plank that you talked about earlier. This was on the longhouse at Thunderbird Park in Victoria. Mungo Martin um, put the roof on this. It was um, where he carved in public when the potlatch was banned. They said they couldn't do it. And he said, fine, I'll be at Thunderbird Park. Come get me when you're ready. So when they tore it down, Randy discovered that the old growth cedar planks, you look at this carefully, you see square holes in it. that yeah. dated somewhere back to the 20s. That's when Mungo Martin was there um, carving. Just another example of old growth red cedar. So among other people, uh, Chief Bill James, an alumni, became a friend of mine over the years. We visited back and forth. Bill and his mother, Fran, came to sing songs at South Beach every spring. He was most excited on one of our visits to show me his final map of the navigational points. You talked about the canoes. They use navigational points instead of stop signs and, and freeway signs to travel the islands by canoe. He just retrieved the last Lummi name for the only point left without a name. The map was completed. It was a dream come true for him. This pole is placed on the eastern point of Henry Island. Bill translates the final Lummi name um, of this to mean of this land. The pole sits on the last point in the United States as it looks across Harrow Strait to Canada. The eagle sits atop the raven, two opposing clans. They're both supported by the sheer mass of the killer whale. Oh God, there's that feeling again. Does it emanate from the design? Or is it the strengths of the ancient wisdom of old growth cedar? Mm. Maybe we should ask somebody whose life depends on ancient cedar trees. Maybe somebody from the other side of the slough. <laughs> Maybe somebody like Randy Cook. Ah. Uh, speaking out for old growth cedar. Yes. Let's welcome Randy. Hello. There he is. Hi. <laughs> Hello. So where do we begin after a wonderful presentation by Lee? <laughs> well, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, Lee, for inviting me um, to come along and meet Paul and Laura. Um, well, you know, and our whole community here you're yeah, going to meet. And, and yeah. everybody else this beautiful Sunday morning who gets to sit, have coffee, and, you know, listen to a good conversation around art, history, and... Yeah. you know, everything else that we're faced with. Um, um, but yeah, anyway, just a quick little intro. Yeah, my uh, traditional name at birth is Kalapa. Uh, I'm from the Kwakwa Kiwab Nation, but I'm from the Numgis and Montagila tribes. Um, I hold a chieftainship from my great grandfather. Uh, his name was Makola, which means moon. So that was uh, chieftainship was passed down to me, and I potlatched um, a few times now to <clears throat> excuse me to uphold that standing for my family. So I now hold the chief name Makola, which means moon. Um, so yeah, so diving into some of the work that I do as an artist um, is uh, deeply rooted within these, you know, my identity and who I am and the responsibilities that come with being a chief. Um, one of the biggest questions I asked myself um, when I was quite young and taking over to be a chief for my family is what is the role of a chief if he doesn't have any land that he comes from? And, um, you know, and I said, you know, and who are we, you know, as Indigenous people once our ties are severed from the land? And, and, and I'm not just talking about the land itself. I'm talking about the connection that we have to the land and our deep um, philosophical outlook and connection to the land. Um, so what I do in my own time um, is I get out um you know walk my traditional territory um connecting with the cedars you know just with life with life itself everything that's around me and i look at it through the lens of all of my teachings from growing up and <clears throat> and i think about ceremony and i think about rituals and i think about myth stories and i think about creation time and 
the creation stories are the most significant ones. Um, you know, if I were to talk about my father's side from the Numgis, I come from uh, the great Thunderbird, Quinusila. And in the beginning of time, uh, there was actually a steelhead man, and his name was Huahuatza. And Huahuatza was able to transform between human and uh, steelhead. So at the time of the flood, he was able to live because he could swim as a steelhead. And as the flood started to subside, he transformed himself into a man, but he was sitting on the end on the side of a beach and he found himself all alone. So he started to pray. And through his prayers, um, he started to see this great thunderbird uh, descending from the sun. So through telepathy, they were speaking to each other. And the Thunderbird was asking him from a great distance through telepathy, what is it that you are asking of me? So as the Thunderbird Quinusila landed, he transformed and he took off. And the story, it says he took off his Thunderbird costume and he pulled the beak up and underneath him was a man. And they started to discuss the early civilization of what it would take, you know, to create the first big house. And this first big house was erected in a place called Utsolas in the Nimkish Valley. That place is still there and it's very significant. And due to the impacts of colonization, we were forced away from that sacred place. But my, my dream is to go back and rebuild that house, the house of our ancestors. Mm. Um, so I hold the position Makola, which comes from my mother's side. Um, and that's a different tribe where we come from the Kulus. And um, it's a story about actually a supernatural seagull. And then in the later stories, he became a Kulus, um, but also transforming into man and building the first house. So when I talk about my art practice, you know, and these stories and why they're so significant, um, it's about our relationship with the environment. So when we talk about who we are as Kwa Kwa Kiwok people, our origin stories talk about us descending along, coming along the path of the Milky Highway, that we weren't from here, that we were from the cosmos, that we're from beyond, and we knew and we came and supernatural with supernatural powers as beings, and we were able to transform. But upon landing, descending here, you know, it is said in some ancient stories that there was no other life other than the animals. So what the first ancestors began to do was transform all of the different animals into different clans and they gave them different languages. And, you know, all of these different civilizations started to begin from there. And these are ancient, really ancient stories. And, you know, here in you know, on Vancouver Island, we talk about the Bering Strait Bridge and, you know, there's all these different theories, but we're like, no, our stories are much older. We've been here. Yeah. And science is starting to catch up. So, um, so in saying that, you know, these stories um, have become my life in, in my own practice, I guess, I guess you can say in my own, as my own means of decolonization, decolonizing myself in a way of, you know, really understanding who I am as a Kwakwakuo person to really honor what a chieftainship is, is to understand what our relationship is to our environment um, <clears throat> and the responsibilities that come with that. So when the first ancestors were building those first big houses, all of the rituals, all the gifts we obtained in order to create ceremony came from the forest. There was a very clear understanding that there's life in everything, that there's this constant flow of energy that is pulsating through every plant, every tree, you know, every insect, every animal, you know, and we are guests as the human species, you know, and we have a responsibility to honor and uphold that, you know, that energy, that existence that has been there for, um, for millennia. Um, so we learned to work with that. And for tens of thousands of years, we became the scientists essentially in discovery and wanting to learn and research and understand how tree communication works. 
how plant communication works, how societies work within that. And all we essentially did was we mirrored that those relationships so what we learned from that we took into ceremony and we mimicked the things that we saw Um, but one of the greatest things that um, I find fascinating that I work on quite a bit are culturally modified trees Um, culturally modified trees are when the bark is pulled off of a tree but the tree continues to grow Um, So the bark would have been used for many purposes, you know, it could have been weaving, regalia, baskets, all these different things, rope. Um, And then you could also prepare the tree. If the tree was young enough, you could pull the bark and the tree grows in a very specific way. But as we all know, with great cedars, they hollow from the inside. So what they would do is they would be preparing these trees to essentially become canoes. So then they could cut them down where they were, hollow them a lot faster, and then pull them out and use them. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff too. But um, but in more recent uh, times, I actually took a break from my career um, as an artist and decided to go get my master's. And uh, it was quite interesting. It, it was an interesting conversation I had with myself <laughs> because you know there's all these different definitions of what a successful artist is. And I, one day sitting at work, you know, I looked at my commission list and I think I had work set up for like two years. And as you know, as an artist, I mean, that's essentially a really good sign because that's just two years that you're writing down because you can't push beyond that. And I felt really good about it. But at the same time, I felt pigeonholed. And I felt I was going to my studio and just kind of recreating pieces. And it just became a list. And I was feeding everybody else except myself. I was losing a bit of myself. I was losing that feeling of what it meant to be an artist. I was losing that, um, you know, that curiosity of what it felt like again to go and connect with the energy, connect with, you know, all of these different elements that fuel me and feed me and give me, you know, more. I think we're all thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I pulled the plug on all of it and took a break and went and got my master's and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know, you know, I was like, I think for the first six months, I'm like, what the hell am I going to focus my master's on? (laughs) And then, um, uh, but it hit me when the pandemic hit. I was right in the middle of the pandemic, everything locked down. I was sitting in my kitchen and I started to investigate viruses and I became curious and I started to, you know, look down, you know, I just kind of went down the rabbit hole and I was like viruses. And then, you know, looking at the, the amount of plants and trees that carry viruses, there's billions and billions of viruses that are, you know, all over within nature. Then I started to look at colonization as being a virus. And then I started to think, how do we heal ourselves? How do we move forward? How do we break away? Why do I feel so restricted? Here I am locked in my house. I can't go out like, you know, and so I started to kind of go down that path and I started to think of it as an opportunity. And I started to see it as being something that could be amazing and transformative. Um, So then i started to move myself back into this question around relationship to our environment and asking myself again you know like as an indigenous person you know what are these responsibilities so then i started to you know dive into some you know books and then i kind of stumbled into suzanne samard's books on tree communication uh then i started to read a little bit about what she was saying And then I was like, oh, well, she's just talking through the scientific, you know, formula of what tree communication as what we have been doing for tens and thousands of years. But she's just writing it in a whole new um, language, in a whole new language that's accessible. And I thought, this is brilliant. So I phoned her up and I just, you know, called her and said, hey, let's have a meeting. Let's talk about your book. And then I started to show her some of the work that I was working on. And she said, you know, she goes, the work that I'm doing is really just bringing to surface the knowledge that you as Indigenous people have always carried. Yeah. So it was really exciting. So I started to restructure my form 
and I started to restructure everything that I had thought, everything that I had learned as being an artist, as being an indigenous artist, because going back, you know, and thinking about the impacts of colonization and the extraction of these beautiful masks and ceremonial pieces that were placed in museums, um, what's what that has provided is it's become a library um, for all of these beautiful objects. But what's happening in the current commercial art world is they're still seen as objects. Nobody's asking a question of how that mask came to be or what it means. What is the significant meaning of that? Yeah. And who does it belong to? Who was that person? What was the vision? What was the energy? What was that? Where did they go? That information has been severed. So I made it a huge priority in my career now to make everything about that information. Mm. So, you know, so to talk a little bit about the preparations of ceremony, what we do as Kwakwa Kiwok is, um, you know, we're the opposite from the, what, who we call Lachulis, like the planes who, you know, they do sweats they go hot, you know, they do, you know, for their purification, their cleansing, we go cold. Um, so going back to a story, um, there's this uh, mythical creature, his name was Utmeh. And Utmeh was the raven who released the light to the world. Hmm. So I dove into this simple story. And I started to pull all the other stories out about Utmeh. Utmeh actually dove to the deepest depths in the ocean to pull roots so he can plant them on earth so we could have medicines. Utmeh gathered all the first mythical creatures together in the very beginning of time and pulled them together and taught them how to feast and the meaning of feasting and nourishment and how we need to nourish these bodies that we've transformed into. But not only that, how to create community and, and nourish the community and feed them. So then he taught them how to give and to celebrate. But in the very beginning and releasing the light, it wasn't the, you know, the literal sense of, you know, he obtained the sun and the stars and the moon. It was really about enlightenment and the power of that. So Ume said to the people, he said, you know, in the, um, he said, the greatest gift I can give you is as the sun is rising every morning is to remember that that's the greatest gift because yesterday is gone. Mm. You have to learn to live in the moment. And if you can live in that moment, when you cleanse while you're fasting, you cleanse in the glacier waters as high as you can get in the mountains, the cold is going to purify your body this physical temple that you're going to carry the mind the physical the heart all of it is going to contribute and it's going to protect the spirit because we believe in reincarnation so the final step of the of the process was um meditation and striving for higher consciousness so we would be able to leave our physical bodies and fly around the world and do all of these amazing supernatural things so the songs that were sung in ceremonies, they talk about that flying around the world. And I didn't know this earlier until I started to really think about all of these little things within my own culture, because I heard the songs and then I thought, oh, they're so cool. Like they're so poetic and flying and this and that. And it wasn't until I went back to the ceremony and the rituals of preparation where I was like meditation mm -hmm. and physical and bathing and all of that. So we would tap into that higher consciousness where we could literally communicate with the trees, with the animals, with all of that. We became one. Um, and we have two very significant ceremonies that we um, that are just they're the law and um, they're the most meaningful ceremonies in one's life. It's called the 10 month ceremony. We call it 10 moons. And it's the mirror image after a baby is born. So there's 10 moons in the moon and 10 moons after. After those 10 moons of being in the physical world, you get your first name. And they put ochre on the baby and they do a, a massive naming ceremony. And the only other time you do that again is when you die to prepare the body to go to the other side. But the reason we do that is because you, we only mourn for four days. And we're very strict about it because we need that spirit to come back because we realize it's just the physical body. It's the spirit that needs to 
constantly be moving and it's alive and it's shifting. So now coming back to these objects and museums, before, you know, if one was going and fasting, they would connect and they would, you know, put their forehead on a tree and say, as I breathe life into you, you will breathe life into me. Mm. There's this energy that is constant flowing through everything. And so I took it upon myself. I said, well, these are just objects. It's, you know, like people are saying, you know, of course they're sacred. Of course they're meaningful. Of course, you know, getting there. But really it's the spirit. It's us. It's who we are. It's, it's that those, you know, those intentions, it's the process. It's the, um, you know, the fasting and the meditating. I mean, it's those, that, those things we really have to nurture but we can't do it without our environment. So then for myself, like I say, I, I walk the territories and I'm going back and seeing more logging. A lot of our traditional territories being wiped out. A lot of these ancient culturally modified trees where the bark was pulled a thousand years ago between somebody formulating a sacred ceremony, a space of connection is being cut down. And that is the, these are the last standing evidence of who we are and our connection. And what is any of this going to mean when we are standing, you know, when we can see clear cuts for miles and miles and miles, objects become nothing. They're, they're empty. Masks are empty. All these things are empty. If we don't have this relationship with our environment, if we can't keep the spirit thriving. So that's what I focus my work on today is um, I've literally um, recreated an entire new form for myself to bring this information forward, to talk about the energy, to talk about who we are, you know, as human beings and our relationship to the environment. Um, and in, in my and in all of my beliefs and everything that I've been doing, all of the ancient work from all of these ancient stories, I've never in my life heard a story talk about division between races. I've never heard that's you, this is us. I've never heard anything that would stem and create racism. I've never heard anything that creates, you know, a separation between hierarchy you know, colonization created big chiefs, to be honest, you know, like the, because of the introduction of uh, currency and power, you know, and people who could have and bigger, latches. bigger potlatches and things like that. But I'm, I'm kind of pushing that aside and getting back to the root. I'm, I'm going back to, you know, the early stuff, because I feel like as a human species, we need to heal. And there's so much we need to heal from. And I think all of the healing properties um, we are in search for are really coming from these early beginning, these early stories, the ancient stuff. And that's where I, I get excited. So anyway, you know, so it's a nice long intro for, you know, everything. Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> you covered a lot of ground and we have some questions for you. <laughs> and let's put Lee back up too. He'll want to weigh in as well. So, um, boy, you've said so much. <clears throat> so, Huh. That that origin story of we came from the Milky Way and we are spirit beings coming down and inhabiting and putting form and, uh, and these bodies and this planet and this earth and this environment, we need that in order to um, do what we do. And even material culture, it's so interesting that you see material culture as containers for spirit, to hold spirit. So similar to your understanding of what human beings are doing in our role here. Um, that's so beautiful. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, these childhood stories. You got to grow up with your traditional elders, didn't you, before you went off to high school. So you were immersed in, in your lore and the stories and this worldview from get the get-go. So. Yeah, yeah, I was very fortunate for sure because I was raised by my grandparents and um, somebody super significant. My grandfather was a big teacher. He was an artist, uh, but he went to residential school, but he was actually still quite lucky because in the summers and winters when he would get to see his family, they were still actually potlatching underground because it was during the potlatch ban. 
So he got to carry his culture with him still and learn about it. My grandmother, um, she was actually hidden uh, during when the RCMP and the police would uh, charge into the villages by boat. They would extract all the children from the villages and force them on a boat and take them away to the residential schools. Her, um, her grandfather actually hid her. He took her and wrapped her in a blanket and brought her up into the mountains. And she, she said she could hear all the village crying and all the children on the boats being taken away. And it was just horrific and awful. And he held her really tight. And he just said, you know, I'm not going to let you go. But he was a really big chief. And he was one of the, like, the real um, <clears throat> significant ones in keeping the potlatch going at that time. Uh, she said that he would meet with the chiefs every week. And they would have tea um, and they would actually be lunch, like strategic chief meetings and strategizing how they're going to keep the system going, but also how they could make it look like um, like a colonial celebration. So they would potlatch at Christmas and they would wrap up gifts and they would invite people. It would, they would literally be having a potlatch, but at the end they would give these Christmas gifts. So when the RCMP came in, they would see all these Christmas gifts and they would make it look like it was a Christmas celebration. Huh. So they were always thinking and doing stuff like that. But my gran got to travel with him from village to village and see and witness everything that was happening. Um, so she was, you know, as fluent with the language, she spoke the old ancient language that actually has, you know, died off now. But all of those early teachings, like I remember... For example, um, nowadays we talk about, you know, we should mourn for a year um, before we have a big potlatch after a chief dies. And my gran was the first one who told me, she said, that is absolutely wrong. She goes, that is, that means you're carrying illness with you. And that goes against everything that we are. Who would carry the mourning for a year? She goes, we had four days mm -hmm. You mentioned four days to prepare. And then you do the preparation because we want to invite the spirit back. We're, we're here to celebrate living and life and the celebration of life and to care and to carry, to mourn for too long is to create illness and it turns into illness in your body and, you know, and you're not living anymore. You're not well, living. Especially anymore. when you know that that spirit's going to come back in a new form, right? Mm -hmm. So you would celebrate the, the renewth and the regeneration. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of belief and a lot of faith you really have to put into that. You have to live that. You have to really, you know, believe. And she did. And, you know, when I moved to the city and I remember there are certain times she said, you know, don't forget to leave your bowl out on the back porch when it's raining. So you can just uh, give thanks to the creator when the sun is rising and wash yourself with that rainwater. She said, it's just mm -hmm. as good as if you're at the river uh, at home because now that you're in a city you're far from home she goes you can still do the work <laughs> and uh, nature that, with you. You know? yeah <laughs> you mentioned the commerce that our western worldview is has an economy to it that is quite different than than this reciprocal nature and the flow of energy the flow of nourishment in it about accumulation but the potchlet is about redistributing wealth isn't it about gifting keeping the gifting going can you describe you mentioned the potlatch what its purpose was what its still is, um yeah. its role is yes it still is i have friends that go to have been honored to go to potlatches and they talk about that yeah um but yeah, there's, so there's a two part. I mean, there's the ancient philosophy, which I was talking about with Utme and, and the power of giving and nourishing. So we have feasts and you gather the people and you feed them. The greatest gift that you can give in our culture is to have your guests leave with a full belly. And, and we have songs and we call them burping songs. And if you're burping, that's the greatest compliment you can give to your host. Because that means you're full and that there's nothing more in life that matters. Everything else is all, you know, it doesn't really, it's all about the physical and making sure that you're happy and you're fed and you feel good about yourself and your spirit is raised. And as a host, if I can elevate you in any way, then I'm doing a good job. So the potlatching was more structured in the winters and it was a big part of our government system because we would transfer 
um, goods. Um, sometimes between dowry, there would be arranged marriages with, to strengthen families. Um, and it was all to protect resources. So we would transfer rights and titles to maybe my family on my left side has a big, strong, flowing salmon river. And maybe on the right side, they have clam beds that we don't have. So if you can bring that together through marriage, you know, then the kids and the offspring would be that much more wealthier and celebrating, you know, and how they feast and nourish. Um, uh, but like I was saying, the impacts of colonization, though, when Europeans started during the fur trade and stuff started to introduce uh, currency, um, a lot of the earlier chiefs at that time, because it's just before the potlatch ban, started to recognize that they could accumulate more through the Hudson's Bay Company by, you know, accumulating more wealth. And if they could give away more, then they would be bigger chiefs. And it started to create a ranking system, mm -hmm. which started to create actually a separation and more division even amongst our people, because then, you know, ego started to kind of like grow from there too. But the ancient philosophy, uh, going back to Utme, the, the raven, um, was essentially um, to understand that there's nothing greater in life than life itself. And it goes back to fasting and giving thanks as the sun is rising. You don't need materialism to make you happy. None, none of that matters. So to exemplify that, to be a chief, you give everything you have material wise in your home. So chiefs would have apologies. And my grand said, my grandfather, he gave away the kitchen table, the chairs, the china, everything, because he knew like it was just stuff. And that made him so full inside seeing the pride and joy in people that he was able to elevate them. And, and in turn, she said, everybody, all the other chiefs, when they had polishes, gave them twice as much back to show how grateful they were. Um, but we've, we've really lost a lot of that. I mean, today, like I say, like I've had polishes and they cost a lot of money. We don't, you know, get it back in return the way it used to be. It's more like a currency thing. Um, what I'd like to see is people like going back to a place of just being humble where everybody can still potlatch and it's not based around how much money you have to accumulate stuff. It's really about elevating the people and making them feel good again and having them leave with that feeling where, you know, maybe you can afford 400 apples and oranges. That's okay. You know, that's, that's where my belief is going backwards you know, let, let's, let's get back to the place where it's about the people again and those feelings and it's not based, you know, because now we have families who are restricted by that and, you know, they're like, oh, I'd love the potlatch, but I can't accumulate enough money to feast and give away stuff for a thousand people. But, you know, so anyway. I know, I know that the government came in also. You mentioned burning down one of the major cultural centers, the longhouses, and grabbing the goods and then putting them in museums. But the museums now have been repositories of those um, those artifacts from which you learn. How did you learn the forms? I know Bill Holm was very instrumental. His wife was um, what an honorary member of your tribe. That You had deep connections. Where did you go to learn the, the forms and um, and what do they mean? How is the iconography embedded in that? Can you speak to your art mm -hmm. and your education there? Um, mine came from my grandfather sitting with him. He was an artist. Um, we actually didn't know who Bill Holm was. My grandfather didn't really, you know, mm -hmm. didn't pay attention to anthropologists or anything like that. We, we just literally lived on our reserve in our own home. And like I say, they grew up with their families with songs and art so our art form of the Kwakwa Kiwak was much different than Bill Holm was actually exemplifying he oh. focused more on the form of the northern tribes and he really brought the form through but if you look in uh, some of the art forms of the early Kwakwa Kiwak there is no art uh, form line it's uh, very loose and broken up there isn't actually any rules at all <laughs> it's uh, very open and if you look in some of the collections um, like um, 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 Bob Harris, for example, uh, if you're a museum, lots of color, lots of, you know, uh, just very explosive. Like if the Kwakwa Kiwok artists and, you know, during 
uh, contact times because they had access to different color paints and materials and everything, they used it. They weren't afraid to do anything. Um, and that's something that I take forward in my work today because I studied so much of it. And that's the part that excites me where I'm like, there were never any rules. There was never any limitations. So why should I do that now? So I've actually taken that a step further now in um, the conversation around preservation of old growth. Um, because some of the questions I'm asking again is like, you know, who are we as, as artists if we don't have any more cedar to carve? So now I'm saying, well, we adapt because that's what we were always doing. So now I'm looking at different materials to still be a storyteller and looking at new technology. I embrace science. I embrace all of these, you know, current things because I think the conversation we need to be having is now, like right at this moment. And I don't think if I'm going to reiterate, I don't believe reiterating stories from, you know, a thousand years ago from my culture is going to serve the world in any sort of way. I think we need to kind of inc be inclusive and mm -hmm. make a conversation that is now and current. And one thing that we do all share in right now is climate change. It's all around us, you know, the, the impacts, all of the things that the planet is suffering. And if I can take a little bit of that early philosophy through and just saying, hey, we have a responsibility and it's all of us. We're, we're all one, one race here, the human. One species, family. Yeah. One family. And it really comes down to us and the relationship with the planet. And, and we need to look after the planet because, you know, if we're not more superior, and I think those are just the teachings of my, you know, of my people. So, Can you tell us more about the stories and the, and the teachings? Um, <laughs> well, there's stories for everything, uh, you know, and like I say, like I go back, um, I, I love the ancient I love the ancient stories for sure, but I think, you know, I've done so much of that now. Now I'm really looking to more current moments and recreating stories and, and telling stories of now. Um, so a lot of my work is really about how do I, you know, break down these walls of division? How do I break down all of these things that colonization has created that separates us? to bring us back to a place of just saying, hey, you know what, we're all one here. And, you know, how do we create, you know, artwork that can, you know, share that information? I mean, like I say, like I'm integrating science, uh, ecology and form is what I'm calling my work now. It's like coming together and, you know, and exploring and pushing that forward um, because I want it to be able to be accessible. So we, we can have a conversation together um, that isn't just about listening to me and my history. Right. It's actually about us interacting and engaging with each other and finding ways of doing that. And I feel like that's, that's more important to me right now. Speaking that's of your art, Paul put together a little bit of a slideshow with a few of your pieces um, with your permission. So, Paul, do you want to show those? We saw that, but his, Randy's new work. Okay. It's very exciting. And I think it's uh, exciting to pull the ancient wisdom forward in a new way, as you're saying. And um, do you want to go down to the new piece? Um, actually, I'm not, I'm not on the slideshow yet. You're not? You know, keep, no, oh. It's, oh. It's kind All of frozen right. on me, so just keep, oh, he's, keep going. Oh, it's frozen. Actually, yeah. Randy, what I wanted to bring up is, is that I, what I, was a fresh perspective for me in the first time that I spoke to you was that um, being a contemporary artist native artist bringing the knowledge forward that there is a there's there is some limitations to people wanting to hold to the old art the old forms the old ways and that like you're saying the integration of both science using copper using metal using all these different materials industrial paint industrial paints car paint all the different things that you've been experimenting with um pushing forth the message and keeping it keeping it alive keeping keeping the message moving forward I think that's something that I really honor, and I, and I wanted you to speak about that just for, for a bit more. And we can't see those pieces? I'll, I'm going to work on the slideshow while he... Oh, okay. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. A little bit of a glitch. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so just thinking about your question. So just kind of like taking the ancient information and moving it into the contemporary, is that the question? And just utilizing, you know, some of the materials and paints that I'm working with? 
Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of getting your master's degree and what you what you're working on and pushing forward. Well, you because- went to Pilchuk. You went and worked with the Jahuli School. You went to um, where mm-hmm. else did you go? Yeah. Yeah. Well, even if you say you go to the galleries, have a certain thing that they're looking for, and they, may, they want to always stick to the traditional ovid shape uh, North Coast artwork or whatever, and you're pushing that boundary and saying, no, there's new, there's, new, there's new discoveries to be found within our tradition that I want to represent, and I want the stories to be told in new ways to keep it fresh. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, we live in a time now where we've, going back to materialism, we've accumulated so much on this planet and we're discarding way too much, way too fast, way too much plastic. You know, we're, we're destroying ourselves and, and that's, you know, that's the reality. So there's enough material out there to recycle, you know, and I'm starting to look at that and saying, you know, for example, um, you know, instead of cutting another tree down, um, you know, for my own financial gain and knowing that, hey, maybe it's kind of like if I were to look in my own backyard and say I had 10 cedars there mm-hmm. and I'm going to cut nine of those down or nine of them get cut down, you know, and I don't have say and I've got one left. Do I want to cut that last tree down? No. <laughs> Just so I can, you know, maybe make a buck. And that's where I'm at. And that's what I feel honestly feel like. So now I'm looking and saying, no, I want to leave that tree, that one last tree. And I want to get to know that tree. I'm going to learn from that tree. But there's a lot of other stuff out there that I can use. So, um, so you know, like I, I'll find a mannequin. And I'll re, you know, purpose that mannequin and turn it into, you know, something else from my culture. And it gets to show me how I'm evolving and moving, but it also brings, you know, the figure through Um, and, uh, and allows me to be a storyteller in this contemporary time, but also it brings the material forward where people understand. And and there you go. Yeah. And, and this is, um, and this here is Umeth, who I was talking about the, the Raven from the beginning. And Umeth essentially is no different than Jesus, than Buddha. He was a messenger, you know, he was, he was a messenger from our culture. So, you know, instead of looking at imposed religion, you know, which um, residential schools brought to our people, um, I'm starting to resurrect our own stories and saying we have ancient stories that talk about the same things and our relationship to each other. And in the very beginning, they say Umeth was actually white. And it wasn't until he left the big house and the soot from the smoke hole as he transformed into a raven and flew out, made him black. Hmm. Um, but they, but the early stories say when the white ravens start to appear again, that means that the world is in imbalance, that, we, that it's a messenger again, a strong one that we have to pay attention to. So I made this during Black Lives Matter. And I wanted to support and show support for our brothers, you know, down south, our brothers international, you know, who uh, come from a beautiful, strong background, who come from a rich history that were brought here through slavery, you know. And I wanted to show, like, you know what, Black Lives Matter and uh, our early ancestor rising up today, holding up his fist and saying, you know what, there's an imbalance and we need to fix that. Because there's indigenous people from all over the world who are trying to voice their concerns and, you know, colonization has silenced and muffled that for so long, but no, we need to rise up. So he's standing on a cut block, a cedar cut block from a forest um, that was logged out in my territory. And he's also, you know, symbolizing no more, like we can't do this to our land, we can't do this to the environment. And on the pinky of the left hand, um, which is known in Western history, is the finger of information. That hand is down because that doesn't mean that that's the prominent information anymore. We don't have to abide by everything coming out of Western culture. Um, That the world, we all have information that we share. Um, And then these are just all repurposed uh, materials. Like I say, it was a mannequin. The penis and the pinky are just those 
commercial argillite totems that you buy in gift shops that were made. So I kind of repurposed those. And then, you know, the, the penis on there is just kind of me mocking patriarchy also. So there's a lot of current conversations that I want to come through. Like I say, like a lot of my work, I want it to stand for now. But all of these planks around Utmith were actually the roof planks of the big house that Mungo Martin created at the Thunderbird Park here in Victoria. They were repurposing the refurbishing the roof and they were going to discard all of these. And then I noticed that all of the underside of those planks were D ads by Mungo Martin. So I bought them off this guy and it's the collapse of that of essentially of that old structure, the old house of the, of the, these ancient, you know, societies and, you know, civilizations that we think were right at the time of government collapsing and us pushing through. So it's in the early stories, it's about Utmeth who stole the light and he fled through the smoke hole and he released light to the world. Well, those ancient houses of government and everything are collapsing and we're rising through and he's pushing through that smoke hole again with his fist up and saying, no, this is a time where we're going to reset the balance of how we distribute information and knowledge. And it's not always about, you know, the what we read in textbooks in school, you know, everything coming out of, you know, that Western perspective and especially in Canadian art history, you know, um, uh, often we talk about the early expressionists who are coming out of, you know, the UK and talking about being the pioneers and discovering Canada and this untouched land. Well, actually, it wasn't untouched because we were already here. We were just removed from the image and we were removed completely from the entire dialogue. But now I'm inserting that. So a lot of my work is about reinserting us into that part of history where we've been removed. And isn't that the role of art to express the zeitgeist and what's really going on to make manifest the, the, the message that's underlying? So, yeah, beautifully yeah. done. And this is the panel that Lee had already referred to earlier, but it's the honoring the ancestors. Yeah. The hands. Tell us about the hands. The hands in welcome. The hand, What are the hands doing? So the, the panel itself is about transformation. So it's the early Thunderbird uh, descending, but he's got the human face in the center. So it's like it's wings and body all around him. Um, um, but I'm also thinking about history in a very specific way now and the, the influence of uh, patriarchy. And I'm starting to think binary. And I'm asking questions and saying, why do we put he on every early story? Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. How do we know everything was he? How do we know the Thunderbird was a he? How do we know every mythical being was all male? And, you know, so I'm starting to kind of really think about those and the way we tell stories now, too, and saying maybe, the, you know, because our language was different, was that the translation then of early settlers and anthropologists? You know, going back to Bill Holm, you know, and a lot of his research and stuff, you know, he was from an outside and he had an outside perspective and he obtained as much knowledge as he thought he could. But, you know, so much is lost in translation. And we don't really, in our language, we don't even have uh, he, she. Really? When we're telling stories. Yeah, there is none. So it's fascinating to me. So I go back and I'm like, well, actually, if we're talking about mythical beings, then we need to start referencing them in a binary kind of way. So this one is actually giving birth to a, a new a little Thunderbird with his talons out. And oh, he, sweet. Yeah. yeah. And he's surrounded by the ancestor faces, which are all in houses. And those are all the early houses of the ancestors, the first ones that built these temples and structures of ancient philosophy, our ancient connection to land. And the whole thing is about a story of that rebirthing of that information coming through and why it's so important today 
Um, but yeah, but but again, um, going back to you know the question around patriarchy, it's uh, it's it's an interesting one. Even with my own, you know, even having conversations, I think even some of my own chiefs still really hang on to that too. And he, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I like that. Give women our co-equal rightful place. Yeah. Now this is copper. So this is what we were talking about being able to to uh, make a transition material wise. Yeah. I like it when he's carving from the MDF board. That's cool too. We'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 And little elements of copper, you know, because we were extracting those materials at early times and using them. Um, but not only that, I, I just on a aesthetic level, copper just looks so beautiful on cedar. The color, you know, they just complement. So leaving the wood all natural, um, which I like to do a lot of the times too, is I don't, you know, like to heavily paint anymore um, on the cedar on the, um, because I don't know, I think I'm developing more of a relationship to the cedar where I'm just more protective now or something. I think I'm just at a point in my life where it, like I'm honestly asking questions like, you know, we can't get old growth anymore. Not the way we used to. We're, you know, we're moving into second growth. It's, it's the grain isn't the same. The color is not the same as it used to be. Like, we're just starting to see a lot of um, different um, things coming through. So anyway, when there's a beautiful, nice piece of wood like this, then I, I want to show the wood, you know, just as much as like my carving and design and everything else. But it I'm, has a voice too. Yeah, I'm complimenting the material is more so of, of what it is. And then I had one more, I thought, maybe. Oh, then this is a fiberboard sandblasted that you created for uh, a commission for some doors at, uh, I don't know where the They used to have the bright, brightly painted ones yeah. too. Yeah. 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 So what I've been doing um, is... Um, sandblasting MDF board and then finishing them in different kinds of, you know, paint. So I'm, I work with like an automotive painter and he finishes them for me. And again, it's my own little critique on what's happening environmentally, but also that we can source materials from whatever environment that we're in. So traditionally we sourced old growth because we were living close to old growth forests. Now I'm living in a city, so why don't I be, you know, resourceful and use materials that are more accessible, but also can help me to carry the conversation forward in preserving old growth and, you know, sharing that narrative that we can still be storytellers, you know, by finding alternatives. Um, that's, and, that's what your ancestors would do. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, MDF is that. And every time I actually do one of those, I love the way they turn out. It just started through my master's program where I was exploring and trying to find, you know, alternatives to cedar. And this is one of them. And yeah, it's been working out really good. And it looks cool too with the, with the bright colors. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's interesting yeah. how much ancient art was painted with bright colors that we don't mm -hmm. see today because it's worn off. Mm -hmm. So bright colors were celebrated throughout. Yeah. And then we, we visited the Tuolup. Tuol uh, oh, please don't. Well, I want to show this one canoe. Okay. Be and, uh, put me in the picture so you can see just an idea of the size of the tree that was used for this. Um, this tree here, I think, is from 1880, they're saying. Uh, it was It was given as a wedding dowry from the bride of, a, of the family. Anyway, but this, the length and the size of the tree must have been tremendous for this canoe to be built. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any others that you want to show? No, that's just it. The... And then, of course, just showing that all the way from Alaska all the way down through to, I think, Northern California as well, right? Or is it end in Oregon? The, 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 the full spectrum of, of locations. Yeah. I'm going to stop the slides and we go back to a conversation. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, I, for me, it's, it's uh, so inspiring. It's always been, you know, funny enough I'm from the East Coast I grew up in Maine um, and uh, but there's something about the North Coast I don't even want to say symbols 
the iconography, the, the, the energy of the artwork draws me in deeply, passionately. I feel at home, like I was born there. There's something about the artwork of the North Coast that um, all the way, I, I spent time on the, the Washington coast, down the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, and I was just so fascinated with the stories of, of, of when they tell the stories, of course they tell the stories of, of Lewis and Clark. They tell the stories of the white people coming from all the way across the country. And then, but when you read the stories and you look at the, the details, the only reason these guys survived was along the way they were rescued time and time again by, by Native peoples all the way up through to, to Speaking the Speaking of canoes, there's a story of they come with their little canoes um, and, of course, the mouth of this Columbia River, which is the just waters. huge. They can't navigate it. They, they overturn. And then they see women in a native canoe just gliding Back and across. forth constantly, yeah. Yeah, and they're they're just shamed. <laughs> and and this is another thing because because, because of how Hollywood, Hollywood has spent so much time talking about Plains Indians that people don't understand that there was also cultures that were plentiful that had and, and that's in the Lewis and Clark story. They say they come up the river and all of a sudden they see dried fish stacked up like a mountain. They see a culture that's thriving. I mean there's no needs here. Everything has been everything is working. This culture doesn't need Europeans to come along, that they're fine. <laughs> they're doing just fine without you. <laughs> so yeah, that was a sophisticated culture that had abundance, that was organized, that was very populous. Yeah. Yeah. So let us apologize. <laughs> On behalf I'm of Lewis so and Clark. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And, and it was yeah. Sacagawea that, that that was what significant in that whole storyline and her her role. So anyway, um, coming back to you. Randy, but um, and Lee, um, Lee, what is your mission in how, how is art an ambassador to this culture? What is who are your customers? What are you looking for when you put a piece in your gallery? What is your higher mission here to help this culture and the the connection to this culture survive? This is. Um, am I on here? Yeah, you are. Yes. So I guess it's fairly simple for me. I guess when I first started, quite clearly, I didn't know what I was doing or what was going on here and wanted to find out about it. What I did find out, um, my minimal knowledge, I wanted to share with others in a way that would give a leg up to Native cultures that have been so devastated in my experience of growing up next to them. And so um, my goal every time somebody comes into the gallery is to share some piece of knowledge like Randy could do of course, I'm no, nowhere close, but to give them some piece of information they didn't have when they came in. They may have had a preconceived notion about Bill Holm being godlike about Native art, and I can throw something in there that would make them think instead of looking at somebody else. Uh, that's what I started doing. So Thank, I can... you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, keep going. I just yeah. was, I was well, just saying definitely... I would rather hear from that culture themselves than right. a translator. Yeah, well, I think but we had a few resources, but go ahead. Well, the logo on my car says everything is um, native art from the source. Mm -hmm. Native yeah. art from the source. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martha's asking a question. Yeah. yeah. And, and Who's got some questions Martha or comments? Has, Martha has a question for Randy. She's just saying, do you do ritual and blessings at any point in the creation of the art? Is there a, uh, blessings or at the completion? Is there a ritual aspect as you're preparing the art that that you follow? Um, not, in, not in a specific moment, depending on the actual piece. If it is ceremonial and it's gonna be used, um, I still work um, as the ancient artist did, um, where, you know, there's this question now with museum pieces where, you know, people are asking, you know, why aren't the artists recognized and it's about the, you know, the object? Why are they removing the artist names? Right. Um, but there's one thing that comes through, you know, uh, with the work that I do and research and just listening to elders and, you know, understanding. Uh, the artists were actually selected in ancient times because they were channeling a spirit and they felt like that it was the spirit that was so great that it would come through in this artistic, through this artistic expression where these artists were essentially 
groomed in such a way. Wow. So after the piece was made, they wrap it up. They gift it to the person who's going to be dancing it. Nobody sees it ever. It's not about the artist. It's about that piece and that that connection to that spiritual, mm-hmm. to the spirit world. And it's going to be shown in a ceremony for a split second because it's going to be danced. Then it's wrapped up and it's never seen again until that uh, Paul until that family has another Paul Edge and it's danced. So the artists completely removed. Um, because they've surrendered to the greaterness of what that purpose is, that they're giving everything that they can to make that dance something really significant. And they believe in that connection, you know, that spiritual connection. So I still practice that. I don't share, I don't post anything that is for ceremony. You won't ever see a picture of it. You won't ever see it in my portfolio. And, And it makes me feel good. You know, yeah. like I remove myself because it's not about me. And I, I think that's, you know, sometimes, you know, the difference between the worlds we live in, you know, as an artist, you got to put your signature on everything and make sure it's about you and that you made that. But in those, in those moments, it feels still good to me to know that I'm contributing and it's humbling. It's, it's so humbling to feel like, you know, you've let go of that all of those other things and it's not about you it's about that person that you're uplifting <clears throat> so I, I that i take that seriously and you know and i do have my own personal rituals that i will do in those moments to give thanks for that i do ask to you know for it to be a channel i still ask and i will have a clear mind and i will do my you know, my cleansing in the morning and I'll, we'll give thanks and I will do all of those things for that. Um, but in the regular day-to-day work world and, you know, the things that I do, um, I, I, I try and just live it like day-to-day now, like this, you know, this literally has, is my life. Like, you know, treat others with kindness, you know, share a message in your work that's going to bring people together. <clears throat> create artwork that's going to bring a message for now, create something that's going to create uh, a conversation for people that's going to bring them together, you know? So I try every day thinking that kind of way where, you know, it's not about my work and what I'm doing. It's like, what can I do for all of you who are watching right now to look at something and converse with it and then leave with something or, you know, uh, how is it going to provoke you in some sort of way? So mm, Beautiful. You've defined your role as artist. What is your role holding the chiefdom that you do? Uh, complex. Yeah, it's complex. A lot of healing, a lot of uh, big questions, because it's, it's a question essentially that comes down to land and, you know, our resources and um, authority. And, you know, and it comes down to a conversation now between me and um, government, you know, uh, it's, it becomes political sometimes, it becomes exhausting. It's, uh, you know, it's hard. And I think the only thing that saves me really sometimes is my work, my art, because then it, it's the art that saves me because then I get to share the true intentions of, let's just be nice to each other on this level because the government stuff is really difficult. You know, I mean, right now I'm actually, I actually have a lawyer, like we're fighting for some of my traditional land that's being logged where we never gave consent. Um, We're having, um, uh, you know, a lot of our lands being sold off, you know, um, where government's coming in wanting to push us out completely and take a hundred percent. We're getting more fish farms brought into our territories without consent. Um, you know, the last cut block of our old growth yellow cedars is in the process of being logged right now as I speak, you know, like those are a lot of the real, the real stuff. And as a chief, it's like, you know, that's not a question or a conversation, you know, day to day, it's, it's really comes down to me and, you know, the government and saying, okay, well, whose land is this? And then me trying to prove you know, we've been there, but then going back to culturally modified trees, for example, and saying, well, 
If that tree is a thousand years old, that shows that we've been here. But if industry cuts that tree down, which they're doing now, they're supposed to be protecting those culturally modified trees, but industry's cutting them down and erasing us completely from ever existing on that land. And mm. you know, these are some of the things, or you know, they could be midden mounds that they're just wiping right out and abolishing them that have taken 10,000 years to create. You know, things like that. And that that's the reality. So it's a tough, it's very complex. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Good Absolutely. luck on that. So And you also mentioned and I found interesting has how the role of the artist within the tribe maybe equal to being the shaman. I mean, the artist has a specific role that they're trained, that they're, they're, uh, they're set aside with a special gift and a special knowledge in a special way. And it's interesting because in Western culture, art's kind of a play thing. It's not always recognized uh, in an equal capacity uh, of necessary. Um, and so it's wonderful that you brought that up. Yeah, historically, it was like that, where the artists were selected. It was also the chiefs who were the artists, because they believed they were the eldest, and they've gone through all of the rituals to prepare themselves to be the leaders, which um, which often entailed them um, making more sacrifices than anybody else. So they understand the true meaning of life and death, and that you always put yourself on that line of death to you're always constantly you know very close to just moving to the other side of the world uh, the spiritual sense but obtaining as much information to bring back and back and forth so that's why they were also the artists hmm. um uh, so yeah there was a lot of uh uh a lot within those roles for sure yeah do you still have shamans in your tribe do you use the term shaman at all i mean does that does that maybe in... maybe not the word but the role so um in our culture they weren't allowed to actually be known ah. uh, then you're not allowed to talk about it nobody you know if you are one it's never spoken of ever and it's very unselfish and you do the work that needs to be done um you know nowadays i mean you hear people say i'm a shaman and they're like well that's kind of weird <laughs> for me <laughs> you know like uh because it's a really unselfish it's kind of one of those things where yeah. like everything else i think it's like you know being a chief you know he, he, traditionally it's like you don't say you're a chief you know you eat last you raise your people up you give everything away it's very unselfish but nowadays too it's like you know some people are like i'm a chief i want to eat first i want this i have you know and it's like well that's just right ass backwards because <laughs> <laughs> you know? so yeah i think again in this whole healing journey you know as we're moving forward and decolonizing i guess you can say that's that's how i i, I see things it's like you know it's okay to step and kind of just you know disappear into the background and do all the hard work that you need to do to make sure everybody's doing okay. You know, it's like, that's, that's a real honorable role. Well, it's not just the, um, old art forms to pull forward. It's the worldview. It's the ancient wisdom. It's the mindset. It's the cultural knowledge and maybe that the world can so sorely use today. I think, yeah. And maybe coming back to that, that concept that you brought up earlier of living in the present moment that yesterday's sunrise is not the issue today's sunrise you're at today's sunrise so we're not at today's sunrise worrying about yesterday we're living in this time in this in this place it's one of the most powerful things is to be able to greet the sun each day and you know, we have that tradition at the institute where each day we get up and we greet the sun and it changes your worldview it has a, a such a tremendous impact on you um yeah, it's amazing when you start your day with gratitude Yes. You know, and, and that's what our yeah. culture is too is we actually don't uh, all of our language is focused around gratitude we don't actually even have bad words and stuff in our language you know there are things that have been made up in more current times but everything in our language is about gratitude mm. it's, you know it's we we say gila kasla before you start and it opens the door to everything you're grateful for i'm grateful for you being here i'm grateful for the you know everything that I have, like everything is gratitude. So starting the day with gratitude does, it shifts the brain, mm -hmm. it really does. Yeah, and to see that everything's sacred, you talked about the energy 
in every living thing. You talked about its place on the web of life, that we're not above it. We're just, we, we need to take our rightful place back on that web and understand where we truly are. And we can take a few questions if you want to yeah. raise your hands uh, using the... the, the uh, Questions, comments. Yeah, yeah, the reactions button on your Zoom screen so that I can see that you'd like to ask a question. And it looks like Teresa said, Randy, how, how is it you created Beyond the Mask before December of 2019? I'm not sure what, what's that. I don't know. The direction of that question is. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand that. Oh, there, there she yeah. is. Oh. Uh, turn on your mic and you can ask. I, yeah. Oh, when I show people in the gallery Beyond the Mask, we always laugh because now it has a whole other significance. When I asked you back in oh, December 2019, you oh. said it was because women are beautiful, but they have to put on a mask when they face the world. But now I think it's kind of funny that it's uh, beyond We're the We're all wearing masks. Stage. Yeah. So I just thought, I, I always promised them I'd ask you when I saw you next. Oh, yeah. oh right, right, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I was doing um, quite a few works around, you know, the um the female physical form and i did that piece and another one is called and then a few like you know called the spirit within and it, it really was me touching on a more personal level around murdered and missing indigenous woman and you know and oh. the the power and the spirit that eat all women carry around the world and but i just kind of was focusing more on indigenous women and how we're more discarded and there's you know a really sad truth in the way you know in the way that indigenous women are treated you know and i want that spirit to come through more so so the the physical piece is she's holding a mask and as you walk around it and you look at it from the back side you can see through the eyes of that mask you can see through the holes and i wanted you know that to kind of encompass and i wanted women to feel I wanted men to feel what women feel. You know, I wanted the responsibility to go back to men and saying, you know, and how we look and, you know, this crazy world that we live in of imbalance and that, you know, women feel they have to look a certain way when they don't. It's, you know, they're beautiful inside, just as, you know, you don't see, you know, a lot of men out there who are like, changing their appearances to appeal in a certain sort of way and anyway yeah it was just a bigger conversation around that and i i personally have close ties you know to the murdered and missing indigenous women movement um, by losing you know family members and um, my biological mother actually being one so mm -hmm. that's something i really carry closely with me and it's again it just brings it back to the healing work that needs to be done so you know, and I like everything else that I'm working on. I really am a big believer in restoring that balance too, and raising women up. And again, that's what brings the story back to the origin stories. You know, where did this patriarchy take over? Why is it always he in all of these stories? You know, and you know, and again, like you know, looking at it in a binary kind of way and elevating women in the story. You know, right. tell us about the murdered and missing women movement. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, in Canada, you know, where we have the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission now, where the government is, you know, recognizing the dark history from residential schools, the Indian Act that we still live under as Indigenous people. We still have status cards. We still have, you know, we're still referenced as Indians. And, and you know, in 2021, um, you know, we still have restrictions. We still, you know, on reserve, we still don't own our land. It's crown land, you know, where we don't have the uh, equality um, that the rest of Canada has. You know, a lot of our reserves don't get clean water. A lot of our reserves don't, you know, get the same benefits and resources as others. Um, and it's a sad truth. And the murdered and missing Indigenous women is actually about a lot of our Indigenous women leaving the reserves because it's so bad, but they find themselves in urban places or urban areas, but because of the color of their skin, they're not treated equally. And a lot of them are, you know, being murdered, 
you know, and used as objects, uh, you know, sexually or forced into prostitution and becoming mm -hmm. modern day slaves. And it's a really big concern. And the, stati uh, the statistics are through the roof. It's the, for the amount of Indigenous women compared to anybody else. And that's what uh, the movement is about, was bringing attention to that. What can you do as chief? What can you do for your own, the women in your own um, tribe? Well, I have two daughters and it starts there for me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, everything I can do for them to show them and raise them and nieces and family and to make sure that the boys, I have a son who's nine. And I talk to him a lot different than the way I talk to my daughters. And, you know, and it's going to start with him, too, and the way he talks to women and the way he looks and, you know, all of those things. Um, and I think that's all we can do at this moment, really, is to start somewhere like that, to start a conversation that it's about healing. You know, it's about shifting and moving from, you know, all of these things that we're faced with within our current culture. You know, and how do we shift mainstream culture so we can all start to look at each other differently with value and look at the planet with value, you know, then and that's where it comes down to. So it's, yeah, breaking those cycles around, you know, the dominance of power and, and who holds it. Yeah. And we must remember that the earth herself holds the upper hand here. And there, I was just reading about mythologies among the coastal peoples here around the Ring of Fire about what now we can translate and, and see as tsunamis. Um, when, when anthropologists first heard the stories and wrote them down, when explorers came and heard the stories and wrote them down, nobody knew what a tsunami was because they're so infrequent. But now I was reading that scientists can go back and look at the stories and correlate them exactly with, um, uh, yeah, uh, multitude nine uh, earthquake events and that they've now done the geological studies to see the sand brought in into the inland and to see the trees snapped off and and uh, all of that and so if you can only find artifacts going back 5,000 years it could be because tsunamis have wi wiped out the evidence and that you go much much further back mm -hmm. um, we we've talked with um, Jan van Eiselstein uh, the late now uh, about the Ulchi tribe up in Siberia, up in um, up in the, those regions, having tales of the mastodons. That's mm -hmm. going back fifteen thousand years. I know right. some in some places the mastodons actually um, stayed into the transition from the ice age into our now our warming period. But you can trace these way, 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 way back. They're finding evidence that people have been in North America for 23,000 years. They're finding footsteps in uh, New Mexico right. on the white sands. Uh, so new finds pushing the timeline back further and further and further. So I have to ask, have you ever heard any stories that could be um, translated as tsunamis, the great floods coming in? Have you heard them in your culture? Because they say even that didn't get pushed forward. Even those stories got lost because of colon colonialization. Um, because when they asked, very they, they went to the records and they saw the stories written down from 100 or 150 years ago. But tribe members of the tribes today said, no, we didn't hear those stories. And it's because of that break in, mm. in the culture. So I had to ask about that. <clears throat> um, yeah, a lot of those stories come through in potlatches, through dances. Um, and it's the songs and dances that we've hung on to. Uh, like I say, it's people like my grandmother and grandpa who kept the polar system alive. Um, but what's happened now is that we're reiterating these stories through ceremony, ancient dances, songs, but it's almost become a play. And again, it's, you know, like, again, I think like a big part of my work is to bring the information back and those, um, you know, the rituals, the early practice of how we, how we got those. Um, but recognizing also science. And that's why I, I integrate science now. So we can do um, talk about these researches, uh, the research uh, that's coming through. Because one so, strengthens uh, the other. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So if uh, there is an earthquake mask that's showing, you know, and then it's like, oh, okay, wait a second. And then we can look scientifically at the land and say, 
oh, well, that family's showing an earthquake mass, but look at the timeline a hundred years ago at this mountain, this family who is actually showing it, there was a massive earthquake that was there that inspired this. And then there's more to give back to those, you know, to that dance in that really specific kind of way. Um, it's a big, I mean, I really love research. Like I like doing that kind of work. Um, we've lost like so much where masks are spread internationally. You know, like I think like when I was in Berlin, they had 2000 masks from Kwakwakiwab territory in uh, in the basement, not even on display oh my. that we'll never see. Um, oh. And then there's all of these songs and totems and houses and they're spread all over. So what I do is I look at the early origin stories and I connect them to the land. So, for example, my father's side, I'm from the Thunderbird and his name was Quinusila. Our house we come from is called the Gigilgum. So then if I go, and now when I'm traveling, if I see a Thunderbird mask, I'll look at where it was collected. Then I'll know, hey, wait, Gigilgum of the Numgis people. Hey, that's from our house. Then I can take more of that information. And then when I go in archives and I listen to songs and you know I'm listening to audio, I'll find songs from elders singing and they'll say, oh, it's a Thunderbird song from this great chief. Then I'll say, oh, wait a second, that mask is actually in Berlin. That goes with that song that I found in Chicago. And now I can take those, give them back to the family. They can recreate that mask. Now they have a song to sing with it. And now we're kind of piecing the puzzle back together. Beautiful. So That's beautiful. It, it, it's rewarding in a way, you know, I like to do that. And like I say, so when I'm in the process of that, if I were to carve that Thunderbird mask, that's where I do it again in that sacred place to try and restore some of that, to bring it back. And it's really just about the human experience. It's about us yeah. being, knowing that we can tap into something greater and that it was there. We have the evidence of it now, you know? So, yeah. So going back to, you know, just that simple, you know, question of tsunami. I mean, yeah, there's, it comes through. And I like, like I say, like the integrate the science to bring it, you know, to kind of do more discovery. Well, as we wind up, we'd love to hear from Chris Van Poole. Uh, Chris, where are you? Oh. Just a comment. Yeah. Um, you catch me off guard here. So, and we want to thank Lee again for bringing Randy on. Um, yeah. yeah. There she is. Hey. Hi, Chris. Hi. How are you guys? Obviously, well, um, I really enjoyed your um, discussion, Randy. That's just absolutely fabulous. And I love hearing about how you conceive of the one race and all the things you're trying to do to make the world a better place. Um, is there anything, this is a crazy question, but I'll ask, is there anything that I can give to my students at the University of Missouri to help in your mission? Is there anything I can do to share and help you? Chris teaches anthropology. I know, I'm one of those bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not so you're not so bad. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in anything, like I say, right? We as we're starting to learn more on an international level and in, in discovering ancient stories, they're all the same. And, you know, that's what I'm finding is every ancient story is sharing the same message, and it really comes back to our relationship to each other and to our environment. And I think as an anthropologist, you know, as you're going and researching and finding, you know, all of these little bits and piecing things together, um, it's really just to continue paving that message forward, you know, that same thing. Um, because, you know, like I say, we're just at a time now where, you know, corporations and industries and governments, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're just kind of plowing through everything. And I think we really need to hang on to what little we have and in doing that embrace each other. So I think with all cultures in the world, it's the same message. Mm, thank you. And I'm going to throw something crazy out that I've been thinking about a lot with Kui Amange and the work that Kui Amange does. There are some people that say the universe is a big green dragon. For me, the universe is a tree. And I think it has branches and tentacles going through the universe and it holds onto the earth and it holds onto us and that we're on this web, like this big giant tree in, in the cosmic universe. But I've always thought that the universe is more like a tree than anything else. 
what I find fascinating with that is we look at the tree um, for its physical appearance, but what we've dismissed is the mycelium and the roots that can right. spread under Absolutely. the ground and reach right. thousands and thousands of miles and they right. communicate, sending messages to each other. Trees communicate. If one is in distress, it'll send other trees will send nutrients, mm -hmm. you know, and they recognize their kin even. You know, like big mother trees recognize their offspring and, you know, and it's, and it's fascinating. It's and I fascinating. Think we start to, you know, recognize and learn more about that. And we start to realize, you know, just how much damage we're doing. Right. <laughs> and how connected we all are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Chris, for joining yeah. Well, yeah. yours are a resilient people because that same report about the, um, the legends of the flood and the evidence for a tsunami. Yeah, there was a flood and how they rebuilt and they, everything might be wiped out, but they rebuilt again and again and again. So um, resiliency is, is right there. And you're part of that um, weaver putting it all back together again, uh, Randy and carrying it forward. So thank mm -hmm. you. And your role, Christine is vital in the anthropology and teaching and carrying forward in the university setting. And Lee, yours is so vital. Uh, they're helping to interface to the general public um, and bring the beauty, the stories, the myth, the power of the art, art as these cultural containers. What You're putting the new message into the art. You're doing exactly as the ancestors have done from time immemorial, Randy. You're putting the message in the art that needs to be heard That's and cool. embraced and seen. And I think there's so much power in art because it bypasses the intellect and it reaches into our heart and symbol is there as a first language as a universal language right. as the language of the spirits as the language the spirits want us to um, embody and embrace and put forward into the world art mm -hmm. is just one of those vehicles as languages as all the cultural <clears throat> um, stories are the mythologies are the wisdom are and uh, helping women take our role up again as well. Thank you for doing all of that. Mm -hmm. You enlightened guys around here. Yeah. Uh, we need you. So um, such an important conversation. And we, we hope to have more elders from the very indigenous voices that we're trying to learn more about uh, come and speak to us directly. So mm. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you for that and all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Lee. I want to hear from Lee. Any final thoughts, comments? I have a final thank you to both of you. Yeah. To give a voice to Randy. Yeah. To giving a voice from the other side of the slough. What happened? <laughs> I like that. From the other side of the uh, slough. That that slough is just a, a piece of water that runs through it. And that we're all the same people. So thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, we're all the same people. Well, and, and, and Randy. We, we Westerners were indigenous once too. And we're trying to get that wisdom back again. Yeah. We're trying to infuse that into our while. worldview. Right. I, we've got a fractured worldview. And I think this is part of what needs to heal it. So maybe we, the next prime minister or the next president needs to have a master's degree in art. Maybe that's, maybe that's what can change <laughs> the direction of the world. And, uh, thank Real you so much, Randy. Uh, oh, you didn't even tell us the name of, of your gallery. I was going to ask we that, mentioned, yeah. We mentioned Arctic Raven in Friday Harbor. But you, you've just opened a gallery. Uh, yeah, yeah. We opened a small gallery here in Victoria um, called Leaf Modern. Leaf oh. Modern. Yeah. Right. Leaf Modern. And, and if you go to Victoria, of course, the first peoples, and I, oh, I hope the hopefully museums there we love are the, amazing. The, 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 dis, not the display, but the, the, the uh, long house. The long house, the whole, yeah. Yep. In, in Victoria, if you go there, you should go to the museum. Yeah. Uh, and check yes. it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's gorgeous it's and glorious and quite the celebration of those of the First Nations, yeah. So and, and just Vancouver Island in general, I mean it's just a really powerful, magnificent place with so much diversity going on there and uh, it's a special, special place. So And the Burke Museum I have to say is another in good. Seattle, yeah. In Seattle. Yeah. So um, Thank and you. Randy, you really emphasize the need for gratitude, and, and I absolutely am so grateful for your presence today, of course, for Lee's presence, and sharing your, sharing your insight. You know, right now, um, we're, at, we're at that crossroads where 
nuggets of wisdom need to sink in. We need to hear some, some common sense thinking again and some, some ways to kind of dig out of the mire of, of political conflict and worldwide trauma and the things that are happening. And so we look to indigenous people, and it's funny that at your age you seem to have so much you have so much wisdom. You carry that, that role so well, um, Randy. So um, we're really appreciative for you to take the time today to share that with us. And well, there's so much resiliency in all indigenous cultures. They survived. Right. They lived and they survived to tell us about it and to pass it on. Um, and, what, and we've been through climate change before. The human story goes back, what, 300,000 years? We have been through a few climate changes brought on from the transition between the ice age to the interstitial warming period. Now it's ours is actually coming to an end, and we should be going into another ice age again. Um, so who knows what, um, what, Supposedly, what yeah. we've done to the climate, and who knows where it's going. But we have survived these before. And people don't recognize so. that it, it is the native people that are the first environmentalists. I mean, the environmental movement can learn so much by going in and listening to, yeah. to the voice of the oh, first about peoples. About community, about our relation to the universe. There's mm -hmm. so much wisdom there. Right. We, right. Need, we need you. <laughs> we right. need you and, Laura, and, Laura, and Laura refers to you uh, as an elder. Is that fit for you? Does that, is that proper? I said he was very young, but he was still an elder, elder because he's wearing the mantle and, of chieftainship, and he learned from his elders. Yeah. He's carrying that. But that's my answer. Go ahead. We want to hear from you on that one, Randy. That's your answer. Yeah. I don't think I'm an elder. No. <laughs> <laughs> elder, elder in the making. Yeah. Elder training. Uh, Andy, you're an elder among the young bloods. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's, one, there's this one elder I do absolutely adore um, in my home community. Um, she, I think she's like 94 now, yeah. and she's still sharp as a tack. Yeah. She's very, very blunt. And even her sitting there and she was telling a story when she goes, you know what, we do have elders, but we also have, oh, we also just have old people, she said. <laughs> Very wise. And yeah. we can all be the hollow bone. We can all actually be a voice for spirit as well at but, any age. And on a side yeah. note, back, back in the late 1990s, when everybody was buying uh, domain names, I bought the domain name globalelders.com. And I, and I always wanted that to become something that collects, you know, because in, in Western culture, we don't have a path, pathway to becoming an elder. You just become an old person and you end up in a nursing home or something. So we want, I wanted to grab on to, wait a minute, as I age, I don't want to get old. I want to become an elder. And how is elder training going to happen? And where, does, where is it for me to find this information and this knowledge? It's and can difficult. the voices all come together in a global fashion and speak? Because Maybe it's so a, much a youngster wisdom. like yourself bringing forth some wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That will help my eldership. So thank you very much. <laughs>